It's here centre. It's where we're going to surprise the star of tonight's show. They're an international Kiwi with a string of firsts behind their name, including being the first ever Kiwi to star on the British version of This Is Your Life. Now that was uh, a decade ago, and the host was the late Eamon Andrews. <laughs> well, that's how it happened back there, and we thought the time had come to celebrate our star ourselves. Now, you know who it is, all we've got to do is tell her, and to help us do that, we've enlisted the Mayor of Auckland and another one of the prime movers of the Aotea Centre, Dame Kath Tizard. So I'll see you in just a moment. So, Kerry and Dez, welcome back to New Zealand. We love seeing you here, as always. And uh, thank you, Kerry, for agreeing to give us a preview of what is going to be one of the great works of our, of our Aotea Centre. Mm -hmm. Kerry, would you come and uh, reveal our surprise for us. Behind the dunny curtain. Kerry, <laughs> oh. meet your butt. Camera crew. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened to the thing? <laughs> Kerry, I'd like yeah. you to meet Mr. Bob Parker, who is well known to New Zealand television audiences. Mm. Now we have a small tradition uh, with a show that I know that you've starred in overseas, but never in New Born. Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've been described as many things, but Doesn't never a work as that. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> You'll still have a chance to see it in just a moment. <laughs> Would you mind reading what it says on the cover of the book? Mm, thank God it's not read. Um, <laughs> You're going to read it? This is your life. <laughs> oh, thank you, Desmond. <laughs> we have received the following letter from a very special admirer of Dame Kiri's. It says, please give my very best wishes to my favourite soprano on a special occasion and say how much one of her greatest fans adores her glorious voice and her acting ability. The two together combine to produce the two truly great opera singers. This comes with the warmest best wishes and increasing admiration, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, St. James Palace, London. Ladies and gentlemen, Dame Kiri Takanawa, and joining us also on the set, would you please welcome her husband, Mr. Des Park. Des Park. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Park, welcome. Cool to that time. <laughs> You certainly at some personal cost, I imagine. Yes, well, it's all yet to come, I think. Yeah. <laughs> i got to ask you, what was the statue like when you saw it? Well, actually, it's really lovely. I love it. Um, there's, a cer there's certainly a, a great resemblance from the very forefront of you, so I'm, I'm really thrilled, and I, I'm very proud of it. And That's I think fine. it's quite a peaceful statue. You know, sometimes you can, you can, this, this, you can read some messages in these mm. things, and, and the statue has got a lot of calmness about it. And right. I think that comes from the gentleness of the person who made it, too. Well, that's splendid. We caught a glimpse of it on the, on the cover of the Auckland newspaper this morning. We couldn't actually show it on the program because it's not officially unveiled yes, until... Well, you were in the too. way. <laughs> and I was in the way. <laughs> and believe me, it looks a hell of a lot better than me. <laughs> Anyway, as I said a couple of times, it's second time around for you tonight, but we'd like to think that this is a, a special Kiwi uh, way of celebrating you, and uh, we're very proud of you. 
and uh, I know that we're a bit possessive about you in this country as well, I think, because before you'd stepped onto that world stage, you're very much a star already in New Zealand. So tonight we'd like to try and return some of the pleasure that you've given us over the, uh, over the past years, and some, we've got some good friends for you, friends you'll enjoy seeing, including a certain silver-haired god, as you once described him, who recently received a knighthood. I know him. When I'm calling you... <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Howard Morrison. Still as handsome as ever. Isn't it? Oh. You two first oh. met. Oh, sorry. You're going to say something. I'm just saying this is um, my way of repaying her for all the kind things oh. she said that I asked her to say. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't. No. I got that all from a very good source. And it was all true, too. Thank you, Kiwi. Yeah, we think so as well. You know, the first time that you both met was on, uh, I think, on the set of a film that was made here in New Zealand. Yeah. Which was, what, what was that called? 1966? Don't, don't let it get you. That's right. <laughs> and it did. <laughs> it did. Very expensive exercise. Why was that? Yeah. Well, uh, I lost money. I see. And the only way I could get into movies was to invest right. in the movie myself. And <laughs> they should, they should re-release it now as a classic. I mean, yeah. 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 Maybe they'll colour up the black and white. <laughs> but you were great. Oh. Yeah, well, let's, so. let's see just how good we actually do have a clip from the movie. 1966. It was called "Don't Let It Get You." <laughs> <laughs> You see why I didn't make money, Hal? Oh, why did I ever dye my hair? <laughs> well, that was great. And, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank Sir Howard Morrison for helping kick our show off tonight with Dame Kerry DeCarno. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Howard Morrison. Thank you. Well, Kerry, you were brought up by uh, your mum and dad, Nell and Tom Takanawa, in a large house in uh, the town of Gisborne in Grey Street. Tom had a truck contracting business, and uh, Nell took on board is to bring in a little bit of extra income, but I'm told it was also because she really enjoyed lots of good company. It also gave her a good supply of ready-made babysitters. Ah. Now, you recognise <laughs> the voice. <laughs> Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Sir Kingy Ehaka. <laughs> Well, in those days, ladies and gentlemen, Sir Kingy was actually boarding in the house with Kerry's mum, and uh, he was working with the, the Maori Land Court. Today he's a, a knight of the realm. But uh, I understand that babysitting, as you, as you mentioned as you, before you came on, had its dangers. Sir oh, Kingy. yes. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about Shall it. I tell him? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I was nursing you, you were on my lap, and all of a sudden... <laughs> <laughs> Comes the Mimi. You Mimi. I bet that no, no, just a moment. That's the wrong story. I was told I was on your head. No. <laughs> no. No, it wasn't as bad but, as all that. But for 20 years my mother said that she was you were sitting on his head and you he was walking around holding it and it and I did. <laughs> no, 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 you're quite a lady like even at that time. It could be described <laughs> it could be described as a kind of blessing. Same, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> well it's a blessing for her. Looks what happened to her. <laughs> Yeah. What, was, uh, what was Dame Kiri like as a young child? Well, very quiet, I imagine. You don't have to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, she wasn't very, you weren't very quiet at all. You were bouncing tremendously, uh, oh, I don't know. Everybody wanted to come bite your cheeks, you know, <laughs> that type of person. <laughs> Even the old people living with us at that uh, house of your yeah. parents. It was a wonderful house because we had, uh, my mother uh, somehow 
got a whole house filled with Maori people. Yeah. And, and it, was totally, it seemed to be totally unique, but they, one followed the other. So when one left, the next one trailed in, the brother or the sister or the cousin and things. And it was a wonderful household. Mm. Of, but we had an uh, old man, uh, not a Maori. No, no, the only white one there. Irish. Yes. Dad. Yeah, was from, everyone was uncle. Right. And from the moment, you know, I, I was old enough to stop calling people uncle and auntie, I did, because it drove me mad, because everyone said, oh, is that your uncle and auntie? And it, my mother, because it was being polite, you know, other than calling them Mr. and Mrs., you had to call them uncle or auntie, and it drove me crazy. Right. So when, it, when I was old enough, I, I decided and didn't tell any of them. I said, right, you're all Betty, Bill, Bob, whatever. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't matter. Well, it sounds like a great house to be growing it in. Was, yes, it was. A, it, it was. It was great fun. We should thank Sir Kingy to, uh, for returning to his babysitting <laughs> duties for, the, for this evening. <laughs> for a second. <laughs> well, as you grew up, Kiri, uh, so did your mother's belief that you had a real gift, and, and that was a voice in a million. And she encouraged you to develop it, and you were entered into contests and all sorts of things along the way. But ultimately, Nell heard about a singing teacher up here in Auckland, who had become a Sister of Mercy and ran a school for girls, uh, it was called St Mary's College, here up in uh, Ponsonby. So in 1956, you, your family moved up here because of Nell's faith and your talent. And that's really where we begin the next chapter of our story, which is right after this break. Thank you. Isabel, help watch the crate down. Take them out of the crate, Joe. English weather. You're a lovely girl, Kiri, and I hope you have a smashing time tonight. Now, the first time we worked together was for the BBC on a television programme, and I couldn't pronounce your name properly, so he said, just call me Tin Knickers, and I did. Now, here you are today, Dame Tin Knickers. <laughs> <laughs> you're one of the world's finest singers, you're one of the world's loveliest ladies, and you're a great person to be with. Have a great time tonight, and you're not a bad golfer either. Look forward to seeing you on the classic. Yeah. What a wonderful man he is. Yeah, he's gorgeous. He a good really, friend. Yes. He's a dear. He, that, you seem to be able to laugh at him all the time. He right. never seems to be very serious. Yeah, a continuous sense of humour. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back to our live broadcast from the Pan Pacific Hotel in the heart of Auckland. Kerry, you moved from Gisborne to Mitchell Street in Blockhouse Bay in Auckland, and you are about 12 at the time. It was a big change for you, but uh, there were others too that would remember on that day, their lives would never again be quite the same. Hi, Kerry. Remember sliding down the clay bank on Nikau Palms when you're supposed to be doing your singing lessons? Please welcome one of the boys next door at Mitchell Street, Auckland businessman Peter Hanson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Long time no see, I understand. Mm. <laughs> I wonder why he said, oh, we'll just come up and spend a couple of days with you. Yes, Coming up a little bit earlier. All is revealed. <laughs> what was it like uh, living in Mitchell Street in those days with Count Kerry next door? Well, we were, I was in love with him, for a start. Uh -huh. He was definitely a hero. And, and I, I really adored him. And I thought, this is, this is the man for me. But it didn't work out. I see. <laughs> 
We won't, we won't. But I still adore him. <laughs> we still see lots of each other. Well, yeah. you have to adore him, wouldn't you, really? I mean, yeah. it, he's the sort of guy who would take you out sliding a knee cow palm yeah, from. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel so. somewhat excluded from this conversation. <laughs> And then Ma used to call out in her, or shout out in her yeah. voice, Kiri, Kiri, that trumpet come voice. and do your singing lessons. And Kiri would say, gotta go. Right. So but they were lovely, there were six boys and one girl, and it was a fabulous family. It was a, a wonderful family for me to grow up with, so many boys, and, and they all took great care. And, and even now today, we, we have a wonderful relationship mm. with the amount that we see, because some of the, um, Andrew's down in South Island, I don't get to see him. And, right. But uh, Peter's brother, Robert, who I was the closest to, really, um, he lives in London. And we see a lot of him. And, of course, we see a lot of Peter and Joan when they come to London. It's really So you really still nice. retain the friendships that you made in the Oh, yes. It's been a lovely... The Hanson family. Yes, the whole the Hanson family. I don't right. see some of them, as I say. Well, it's great to have Peter Hanson with us here tonight yeah. as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter Hanson, an old friend. Part of the dream that your mother had for you was realised when at the age of 14 you were accepted by St Mary's College for Girls and became a student of the famous Dame Sister Mary Leo. That was the end of an era when she passed away in May of 1989. She was a tremendous influence on your life, I know, and uh, I wanted to ask you how do you think Sister Mary Leo would like to be remembered? Um, well, she was first of all a nun and a very devout Catholic. She loved her God and uh, that was always the priority because I remember when I would always go s singing um, or wherever I would go, I would always have to go into the church. But she also loved her music and I think she was sometimes torn between the two because the music sometimes took over where God had to take a small back seat sometimes. But she was a very dedicated person and, and that's why I think I like being taught by her because she had no other interests. It mm. was just music and, and God. Quite a special person. Yeah. We have a little mm. a film clip actually that uh, relates back to uh, those days. and gentlemen, Dame Sister Mary Leo. And, uh, she's remembered by your next two guests, actually. Fellow students at St Mary's and members of Sister's famous choir listen to these voices. Kiri, you hope you've got your cape ironed and your gloves ready because <laughs> here come some leftovers from the nuns' chorus. <laughs> <laughs> Fellow students then, and still good friends today, please welcome Raywin Blade and Sally Sloman. <laughs> And virginal. Oh, and the virginal. Yes. But we, we had to be very careful. <laughs> yes. You look lovely. Thanks. <laughs> we weren't allowed any jewellery. And did we ever sing anything else but the nun's chorus? That's right. Well, then we, the, all the soloists, of course, came up through the line. Yes. You know, and, and when one sort of went away and did, couldn't sing as well, the next one came up, I remember, and, and finally I got my turn. Because right. they all dropped off the end of the, <laughs> end of the line or something. <laughs> I remember sister used to go along the roads and stop and listen in between each one. Yeah, that's listen. right. Very fussy. Very it's fussy. quite a big choir. We've got a photograph, actually. Have a look at this, uh, this photograph. How do they call you to get into that? <laughs> Raywin and Sally <laughs> and Kerry in the choir. Oh. What do you think, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> that that choir in. Put your hands together for the choir. <laughs> They slipped away and I was about to ask them about the, the special hand signals that Sister Mary Leo used to have. But, um... I didn't quite get into that. <laughs> I think they were mainly aimed at me. Yeah. Is that right? We, we might leave those for another time, I think. Anyway, coming up we've got a commercial break, but first we've got a clip of the famous uh, St Mary's Choir. Not actually singing here as it turns out, but uh, the good news is they are listening to one of their more famous members.
Gorgeous ovation for Soprano Trinity Conowa. This is the motto which I wanted to put on your lovely day, your day. I am unfortunately cannot be with you in person, but I am with you with my thoughts, with my love and with my admiration to you. <clears throat> I know you now by now nearly 20 years and you gave me countless joy and pleasure and most importantly you've been a faithful good friend of mine all these years. I am most grateful for that and God bless you. All my love with you. Bye my darling. <laughs> George Schulte as he broadcast to you live from Auckland's Pan Pacific Hotel. Dame Kerry, you took an early retirement from your academic career to concentrate on the University of Life. <laughs> Thank words, you for putting it so nicely. Yeah, well, I, was going to, I was going to say you chucked school in for a job. But <laughs> More like uh, school chucked me in. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Laura's not a good student. Oh, uh, well, you, uh, you continued your voice studies, though, didn't you? <laughs> with Dame Sister Mary Leo. In the evenings, you made extra money by singing at Auckland's hottest nightclub. Do you remember the floor show at the Colony? Hang on, just a minute. The oh, Colony. the, 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 yeah, it was the a band. Nightclub in town. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. if you remember the floor show there, Bob was, Zell, was that Bob Zell's one? Well, you had to listen to this voice, actually. Mm -hmm. All right, showtime, kids. Let's get this show on the road. <laughs> Kerry, you'll close it as usual. <laughs> you recognise the voice. One thing I didn't do is close it, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome Bob Zell, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> no show. Uh, Bob was the owner of the colony. Um, you mentioned on here that, that Dame Kerry closed the show. Were you able to explain? Wouldn't have gave me a chance, Chloe. <laughs> she had to close the show because nobody would follow her. She was too strong. So all the other acts turned right. around and said, no, no, we're not following her. So she had to close the show. It was that simple. It was... Maybe uh, how they changed the story, you know. Is that right? <laughs> I never closed the show. How do you remember it? <laughs> no, it was not. So it was, I, was, I was a great warmer. Oh. <laughs> no, no, you weren't. You did close the show in the end, because after the first, the third week, I think it was, we said, we're not following her. She's too strong. She finishes up. The audience goes mad. How can you go in? I mean, even Don Linden wouldn't follow you. That's very nice. <laughs> that's very nice. Yeah, that's but I tell you, that's it, was pretty serious. it was great. It was great income, because uh, I needed the money for oh. um, all sorts of things, especially shopping. And it didn't seem to be for music and things, but I, I did have to pay for my fees and things. So yeah. it was important. And if it you'd was stayed with me, I'd have doubled your money. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I lost out or gained. I'm not sure there. What's but twice I, two and six? Five shillings, mm, is it? Yeah. The <laughs> well, term, there speaks a manager. It's five, five quid. It's a lot of money. Yeah, it's actually, uh, you're known today, of course, for your flamboyant garments and uh, things Ooh. like royal weddings and so on. And Bob, what, what was the vine and clothes in those days? Oh, it was incredible. Here was a young lady who came up, sang three or four numbers from um, the popular shows at the time, West Side Story, and then had the temerity and nerves to still remember that the audience in those days brought their own liquor. So they were all Brahms and Liszt by two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I mean, really, they were gone. And this lady had the nerve to come out afterwards and finish up doing Ave Maria, and would you believe, I was sitting in the wings thinking, my God, how could she do this in a nightclub? And you could hear a pin drop, there were tears in the eyes, and that was the toughest audience I think you ever sang to. It possibly was. And it showed the talent was there then, because everybody else had, you know, the short skirts, the decolletage, not Kerry, up to there, down to here. <laughs> Couldn't say a goddamn thing, and still the magic was there. Convent trained. Yeah, the magic was there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Sell. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> a lot of entertainers cut their teeth at that uh, the club called the Colony, and two of them went on to become very special friends of yours, as it turned out, and they remember those days with a great deal of affection. Our last record wasn't a hit. They forgot to put a hole in it. 
We don't like it, but I guess things happen that way. <laughs> you recognize that? Yeah. Lou and Simon. Ladies and gentlemen, Lou Paul. That's right. Not at all. Of course, course it's something in your book. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you, you three sang at our wedding. Yes. Three. Yeah, right. Three. I did too. Yeah. Yes, you did. Yeah. Must have been. I, I was the best. You were the best. Yeah, yeah right. You were we the sh drunkest. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was the night before, I think. Oh. Wasn't it? Yeah. Should have oh. called ourselves Peter, Paul and Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Kiri, I can remember uh, a few years back, that's a long while ago, we used to call it home and all we had at home was a loaf of bread, a pound of butter, a jar of jam. It was about oh, 10, 11 o'clock at night on your way home. Have a bit of a feed at home and that was it. All right, we popped down to your place and say hello and see the rest of the family. Remember the oh. time you came in, the fast yeah. MG? Yes. Very fast, and we, we, we had a party there yeah. on bread and jam and things. <laughs> <laughs> she was such a, such a fun lady that we had a lot of fun to get in little parties at home with Mum. We had Mom some great times together. And the really. weeks. Yes. And Simon and your week. Do you, do you realise how long it has been, though? Because Des and I, were, uh, we had celebrated our 23rd wedding anniversary this past 30th of August. Mm. So we're getting ancient, and you two are looking very good. What thought you going to say we're more ancient. <laughs> There were a couple of other people that were part of a very special group of friends of yours as well. They're here as well. Let's bring them in to join the party. The first one, would you please welcome Mr. Max Cryer. Oh. Good. Oh. weren't always this poised. <laughs> I remember. I, what, have you seen that? Have you seen that rubbish on the television that they're showing of me? Yes, I mean, really, that. I could have hardly bear to move. I'm so terrified it looks. Well, I can tell you something That's terrifying to listen to. <laughs> it was many years ago when you and I went to a nightclub together one night. These two rascals were performing. Lou and Simon were on the stage, and they asked us to get up and do a song with them. And we became the backing group, Lou, Simon and me, while you stepped forward and sang, Love is a Many Splendid Thing. <laughs> but halfway through, and I'll never know why, when it got to the words, In the morning mist, two lovers kissed, you actually sang, In the morning mist, two livers kissed. <laughs> <laughs> and I've spent the rest of the time hoping that she never does that during Madame Butterfly. <laughs> I tell you what, there is that fourth member I mentioned a second ago too. Please let's welcome Father Henry Tate. Oh. And not only is Father Henry Tate a very fine and special friend, but he was the man who officiated at the wedding of these two fine young people over here. And I, yes, I think that's I'm going to say, what do you think of them now? We're holding in there well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a great occasion, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was a good occasion. It was, uh, well... It was the first time for all of us, I think. You'd, <laughs> <laughs> you'd, you'd never married one, no, anyone? No, they no, say. No. Lou and Simon yeah, say. Yeah, we, we, you yeah. say. Yeah. But, you know, oh, Kiri, all the people are praising you because of your music and your singing. I really like to praise you because of your choice of a man. Oh. And I think you couldn't have picked <laughs> a, a better guy. He says it's sweet. Then Des. You can, you can fame me later, Des. <laughs> <laughs> now having known him for so long, I know exactly who picked whom. He picked me. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I mean, he had to be really crazy to do it, but obviously he was at the time. Yeah. And uh, I think I'd be very lucky. I really have. Because yeah. uh, in, in our sort of game, you don't stay married very long in, in the musical world. It's, I mean, you, you drift apart. A lot of but, pressure there. Yeah, somehow you, the life just, because of all the travelling and stuff, you just, uh, you separate somehow, and it happens in the best of wills in the world. But uh, Des is the, the mainstay of our family, and he holds us well and truly together. When um, This is a very rare occasion for us to be away together, away from the children, and it's very hard to, to know that they don't have us there. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult for me, for me to bring him away because I know he should be home there. With the well, I've, you've expressed those thoughts really beautifully. Let's keep the moment going for a moment because there's some lovely footage of the wedding of the year of 1967. Oh, no. Let's have a look. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it lovely? <laughs> Don't look a day older. <laughs> <laughs> Something happened before that, though, didn't it, Des? Oh, no, but I won't tell him about it. No, do, do. <laughs> do tell us. What was that? <laughs> Remember, they were pulling out your veil, Kerry? You almost yes, lost it. That's right. With your train. It was called the wedding of the year in 1967. We know that's true because the Woman's Weekly said it. <laughs> there you go. And they said that. Kiri was the bride of the year in 1967. I think she looks better than ever, 23 yeah. years later. What do you think, ladies? Yeah. And we'll continue this story right after the break. Yeah. is very far away, but I am very happy to have an opportunity to tell you how much pleasure I had working with you all these years, not only because of your beautiful voice and talent, but maybe even more because of your warm personality, your honesty, your humility and your loyalty. You never changed one moment since I met you the first time, in, in spite of fame and success. I wish you and your family good health, happiness, and for all of us that you should sing as long as your beautiful voice and strength allows you. Lots of love to you from your brother. Madame Vera Rocha has been in later years what uh, Dame Sister Mary Leo was in your teenage years, a singing teacher, a guide and a friend. But I guess only you will ever know just how hard you've had to work to appear such an effortless performer on stage. There is one person who knows firsthand about the determination that you found to begin your journey to the top. She became your accompanist in 1965 and that was the year that uh, you would travel to Australia to compete in the Sydney and Melbourne Sun Aria contests. You came second in Sydney, Kerry. And I believe that night was when you discovered the extra determination it takes to become a winner. I recognise the voice now. Please welcome music coach Barbara Brown. Barbara. <laughs> Tough teacher, this one, though. Is that right? Oh, yeah, she's really tough. Well, it seemed, you know, that uh, you came second in that in that Sydney Sonaria contest, and there seemed to be a change that took place at that point. Barbara, remind Kerry about that phase. You were confronted for the first time with the the harsh politics behind the real professional musical world, and it was a turning point in your career. Maybe it was. Maybe it was the very first uh, time I decided that um, defeat was not, didn't sit very well on my shoulders. And um, I think it's been like that ever since. Um, it's rather, I suppose, degrading to be second. And I've never really liked it. But it's, it's wonderful to be, winner, to be a winner. But the most important thing is to be a very good loser. And I don't think I was a very good loser that night. But I've, I've since learnt how to take defeat graciously if I possibly can 
and accept that if someone has a better voice, does a better performance or does anything better, that one should be the first one there to congratulate them. And um, I hope that I've taught this to my children and, and I hope for myself it hurts sometimes. But I watch tennis players do it all the time, so if they can do it, I can sure do it. <laughs> Barbara, thank you for joining Kiri on her program thank tonight. You. Barbara Brown. Well, you have a, a special relationship with the Aussies, as I guess, a part, partly a result. You got that uh, the, uh, the first when you sang at Melbourne. And Barbara was coaching you then, and uh, that change took place, and you really went to number one, and you got it. Recently, the Australians presented you with the highest civil honour when you were made a member of the Order of Australia. Some, of course, would say that uh, Australia had already presented you with the highest honour when you married Des. <laughs> but Aussies still have a special place in your life. We first met at Drunk Island, Kerry. Yes, we're the crew from Half a Loo. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of farmers oh. and friends from South Australia have come to join you tonight. Oh, hello. Lovely. Please welcome Richie and Betsy White. <laughs> Richie and Betsy White. Television. It's great to see you. you into coming over? Oh, I can't they imagine. Can you? They are going to give you, you a call and say, how are you? And, you know, I'll see you next far. year. What's yeah. all this about, about Drunk Island? They said that you, you met at a place called Drunk Island. Well, it's actually yeah. called Dunk Island, isn't it? Mm. But uh, I somehow we turned it into Drunk Island very quickly. <laughs> we've had lots of pina coladas. Yes, yeah. We've yes. nicknamed it. Yes, exactly. yeah. we, we had a but great time there, didn't did we? Did you tell them the story about finding... Ooh, with champagne, excuse me. <laughs> um, trying to, my trying to find you? Half a loo. Yes. Did yes. you tell them that? Oh, yes, well, well did tell, you us tell us about, about it. Tell us. Well, it was my experience, right. but uh, Betsy told me how to find her place. We lived down... What was... It, it was John. Demi John, so South it was East. called Half a Loo. <laughs> and I lost their telephone number, so I rang somebody, some operator in Australia, and she, which she must have been from Darwin or something, and, and I said, look, this place is about an hour from a thing called Job, Loeb, Hobe, just a single word, and it's something like half a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and 20 minutes later, this poor girl searching through everything, she said, could it be near robe and would it be a demi john i said that's it <laughs> i couldn't believe she took 20 minutes but you know with with a in a dress like that how can you find half a toilet <laughs> 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 robe. 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 that's dedication for you but yeah. one of the lovely things about uh, your special friends here is that uh, and if you don't mind me telling this little bit of the story when they met you you were just mr and mrs park and uh, because they live out way out in the outback of Australia, miles and miles from civilization, they didn't know of Dame Kiri, Kiri Takanawa. And so your friends have actually started from the basis of just liking each other. And that must be a pretty rare thing well, in your did, life. Yeah, we, we had a lovely time together, didn't we? Yeah, very much so. Always We've always, always had great fun. Well, you're here Did for a great week and walk lots of Lots of entertainment. The thing is, he, he, he had wrecked his back last time when I was in Melbourne doing the concert, and he, he swore he'd come, so he did, in great agony. But you made it, and we, yeah. we had some wonderful times together. So I'm really, really grateful. <laughs> Still kept up with you on the tennis court, didn't we? <laughs> exactly, and pull them, pull them out of their gentleman farming over there. Right. Well, they're here to join you in the week celebrations of the AATS oh, Centre as well, which is... What's happening to the sheep? <laughs> bah, oh. bah, bah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Not Richie sure. and Betsy White. There are lots of great milestones in your career, Dame Kiri, not the least of which was being asked to sing by Prince Charles at his wedding to Lady Diana Spencer. But way back in 1964, you passed another career milestone. That was the year that you made your first recording. Do you remember that one? Oh. Going back kind of. Produced by one Tony... One Produced by Tony Burke. <laughs> Music was uh, courtesy of the late Aussie Cheeseman. And there were two young entertainers featured on that. Let's have a, a brief listen to one of the tracks off that to EP. <laughs> Oh, 
but I know that you're racking your brains to try and remember <laughs> the name of the other half of uh, that duet. And I don't blame you for not remembering. It's been a long time. The last time you saw him was the day you made the recording, which was approximately uh, 27 years ago. Please welcome Hohepa Mutu. Oh Ladies and gentlemen, Hohepa Mutu. One day, obviously, mm. and that was it. <laughs> well, we met one day for the recording, and that was one that was quite arduous. And then we met for the photographs oh, in Ozzy Cheeseman's right. backyard. That's what it was. You know? yeah. 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 That was lovely. Yeah. Yeah. It was a beautiful photograph. And I mean, uh, one of the marvellous things uh, would be for you to look back, I guess, and say, not only did I know Dame Carita Carnival, but I've made a record with her as well. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It was a terrific experience for me, me. Um, and it's something that I cherish, cherish very much. You know, as I mentioned, it was something that was arduous, but it also was some, something with a lot of fun. Yes, right. it was, and I think a very, very much loved recording because a lot of people have bought it. And, you know, even I think today, I think it's possibly still available and people have bought it. It's, it was very, very early times for me. Uh, something that's very unknown and uh, right. singing in my own Maori language which I had really no knowledge of at all so it, it, it yes it was nice it's a nice nice memory to yes, revive it is. isn't it I want to thank Paul Hipper for uh, or Joe for coming along and joining us yeah. tonight sure. yeah. that record must be quite a collector's item as Kerry's saying coming up we've got the final part of Dame Kerry's show with some unexpected visitors and a message from home Kerry, I hear you're celebrating your life a long way away from here and I'm sitting here in the music director's suite at Covent Garden where I once used to work and I want to send you all our good wishes for a great and entertaining evening. i never forget the first time I saw you, we hadn't met actually, it was when you came to give an audition at Covent Garden. And I thought that was the most beautiful voice I'd ever heard in my life. But I didn't trust myself, so I have to apologize for making you sing twice more before I really believed it. And also up here in this room, you re may remember that we once had a wrestling match. Uh, God only knows why we had it, but we did. And we frightened the life out of Betty Scholar, who was the secretary up here. And she actually rang my wife to say that uh, I was on the floor with a prima donna, and it looked as though I was losing. I hope it's not an embarrassing memory. When I think about it, it gives me great pleasure, and I chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> I do hope you have a lovely evening amongst your friends and your relations and all the people who wish you well, which are very many all over the world. I'm very happy to have been one of those. your return home concert series, Kiri. This time you came home and performed as a diva, a great singer, acclaimed internationally. But 20 years earlier, you also made a nationwide tour, and then you were just our Kiri, but you also uh, sold out your performances to thousands of Kiwis. You can probably, well, I hope you can remember a charity concert at the Bo a Bowl of Brooklyn's about 1970, an outdoor concert. Not long after that, on the eve of your 26th birthday, you were to give a concert in Tauranga. But in Tauranga, there was a small problem, something to do with the musicians and, uh, and their understanding of the music that you had. And you said, there won't be a concert if you don't get me the musicians I had back over the other side at the Bowl of Brooklyn. So they had to rush over. And there began an adventure 
that a couple of dedicated New Plymouth musos will never forget. Oh we arrived with only minutes to spare before the concert. Then a taxi to the motel, a quick verbal rehearsal, and we were on. Now, there's, there's no way that you're going to remember the names of these gentlemen. You haven't seen them since the, the 6th of March, 1970. Please welcome bass player Gelvin Edser, and on the drums, Bill Hartigan. Oh. You may have forgotten their names, but there's no way you'd ever forget their shirts. <laughs> These were actually the shirts they wore for the performance that night, ladies and gentlemen. And they still have them. They still have them. They still fit. <laughs> they still fit, which is even more amazing. That's true. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about that night. You had to rush, you rushed into Tauranga, you rushed down to the theatre. And what happened then, Bill? Tell us about that. Well, I had to go out on stage in front of thousands of people who were waiting for you set my, my drums up and then scuttle backstage and, and make our entrance and, and do it. Yes, yes. And I slid out on the stage as soon as he got ready, just before you went on, <laughs> and I had that one little program which you saw in the clip, and it's got the keys of all the tunes down. I put it down on the floor so he could read it, and I could read it, and then put the lights out. <laughs> <laughs> There's the program you're talking about, yep. and it has about four or five chords written on the side. That's how quickly the whole thing was that done. That was amazing. And you came in, they came in by a private plane as well, uh -huh. on top of everything else. But right. somehow the musicians we had in, in Tauranga couldn't basically play. They just couldn't do it. And uh, it was, it, I could see it turning into a disaster. Well, I think actually Golden had a bit of advice for Bill that night too, didn't you? Yeah. I said to him, uh, just before we started behind you, I said, if you make a mistake, I'll kill you. He said, you worry about you, I'm already worried about me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Gelvin Edser and Bill Hartigan. Thank you. The next guest game, the Dame Curie, is a, a man of opinions, which he's never been slow in expressing, and he's had plenty to say about you, including this. It must be reasonably well known by now that when I die, they will find Kiri written on my heart. Yes, he's here. He's come from London. Please welcome international oh. raconteur, critic, writer and columnist for the London Daily Times, Mr. Bernard Lennon. There's a small program called This Is Your Life. That's it. That's, That's it. it. This is your life. <laughs> Bernard, you're no stranger to Kerry as a critic and as a friend, but also you're no stranger to television and sometimes both on the same occasion. Yes, I was, I did the first big interview, um, television interview with you um, in Britain. And in the middle of it, I remember Covent Garden sent a message, an urgent message, they'd had to reschedule the, the uh, rehearsals and you were to leave immediately and go to Covent Garden. I said, hell with that. She's mine for the rest of the afternoon. And then I thought, wait a minute, they'll, they'll, sooner or later they'll send the heavy mob round. Uh, they were in a tug of war with you as the rope. And years to come, people would say, Bernard, what's that on your mantelpiece? And I would say, well, that's it, Kiri, Kiri Ducano's left leg. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I, what I, what I, I've flown 12,000 miles to, see, to say this to you, darling. And it is this. Um, in all the... I, I saw your international career begin, and I've followed it ever since. And the lovely thing about it is that for all the greatness of your singing, and there aren't half a dozen singers in history to touch it, the wonderful thing about you is that you demonstrate with every word and every note and every smile that it is not necessary for greatness to be accompanied by vanity and pomposity and selfishness. <laughs> And, and that's only one of the reasons I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, honest, Bernard Lippert. Thank you. I didn't have to pay him a bean. I mean, it's all these people <laughs> saying all this. <laughs> I think they say it because they love you. 
Well, if they do, I'm very honoured. And really they care am. about you. Well, they do. And uh, a couple of other people who love and care about you, I might mention now too, because you have two beautiful children. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this time they're not with you on the trip, as you mentioned. They're at school in Britain. But with, with Des's help, actually, we managed to record a brief message from them, so in a way that they, too, could be here tonight with you. Oh, Dad, um, I hope you had a really good fight over. We miss you already. Um, I hope the reunion with everyone over there goes very well. Say hi to everyone for me. And I just want to say that you are the best mum in the world. She finally <laughs> said it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm miss that you were with us here. We hope you had a great flight over to New Zealand. We love you a lot and we miss you. Tony and Thomas Tegano. <laughs> Your, your own mum, Nell, such a driving force in your career, died in 1972. And your father, Tom, an elegant man, and the uh, possessor of the warmth and quiet dignity of a Komatua, died in 1985. And the mantle of the mana of the Takana was passed to another's shoulders. Tonight, joining you to represent Tom and the, the Takanawa family, please welcome his brother, your uncle, Mitter. Kerry, in 1967, in the programme notes for a recital that you gave in Wellington, uh, they actually wrote, it's our sincere hope that Kerry will reach the top and be acclaimed diva, a great woman singer. But however bright her future, we know that she will always remain in our thoughts as Kerry, the gracious, charming girl who captured the hearts of the New Zealand people. Everything we've heard tonight backs that up, how right they were. Dame Kerry Takanawa, this is your life, and about to join you, in the back of our studio here in the Pan Pacific Hotel are the rest of the Takanawa clan.
end of our live telecast. We did manage to run a little bit over, Malcolm. Uh, if you're out there, I'm sure you noticed that. But uh, we thought it was a great show. What did you think out there? I'd like to, uh, like to thank all of you who've come in to join us for the show tonight.